Hey, what's up you guys? My name is Amber, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to be discussing Margaret and the Mystery of the Missing Body by Megan Milks. As a brief disclaimer, I did want to note that this video is not monetarily sponsored in any way, however, Feminist Press was kind enough to send me this copy to review. Before we get too far into this review, I did want to note a few trigger warnings that are relevant to the text, including physical descriptions with negative and judgmental connotations, eating disorder thoughts, habits, descriptions, and treatment, depictions of self-harm, mention of death from drunk driving, and situations of questionable consent. So if any of these things are liable to be bothersome or triggering to you, please have extreme discretion while watching the rest of this review or reading the book. And before I get into my normal spiel of a brief synopsis of the book, it is very very important for me to note that, <sighs> let's just say, this book is real fucking weird. Complimentary. It is very much a magical realism type book where there are a lot of supernatural elements that are just normal and happen within the world. And the book is a bit of a mess of stylistic interpretations. Very, very intentionally, but we will get more into that later. Just giving a bit of a disclaimer before going into the synopsis so y'all aren't just like, what the actual fuck? <laughs> The book follows Margaret, 17 and very unsure of herself as a person after the dismantlement of her very well-known and respected detective club, Girls Can Solve Anything, who had encountered and solved a vast amount of supernatural mysteries and occurrences within their town before falling apart due to internal conflict between some of the members. So part one of the book switches between current day happenings and where Margaret is now as a 17-year-old and many stories of the past of the Girls Can Solve Anything mystery case files that are very like 90s mystery anthology style. So it pieces together a little bit of the story before our current day scenarios. And then the book changes gears a little bit as Margaret has had some intense medical issues due to her eating disorders. So now we follow Margaret as she is committed to an eating disorder treatment center and this part of the book is told in a series of levels after one of the other patients refers to getting through treatment as a game of sorts. So instead of chapters it's referred to as like level one, level two, but then this narrative is interrupted by the arrival of the eating disorder treatment center's resident ghost who goes into into a historical spiel to Margaret and two of her newfound friends and then they are trapped in a giant body of sorts and have to go through a series of levels in this sense of doing different tasks with to get themselves out of this giant body and back to the treatment center and like the regular world and these tasks both get them further through the body in order to get themselves out but it also effectively teaches them different lessons and gives them a little bit more appreciation and understanding of their own eating disorder treatments and you know their situations with their body and things like that. And then the novel ends with a letter from Margaret to one of the other girls that had been kicked out of the eating disorder treatment center for effectively sabotaging her own and others treatments. And this letter is written as a, you know, so many years later kind of thing. It's now Margaret as an adult looking back on you know, different events, what has happened since leaving the eating disorder treatment center with herself and some of her friends from the center. We find out several of the characters ended up being trans and transition after going through their eating disorder treatment and, you know, they get better from their eating disorders. We get a lot of growth and development from Margaret and a lot of looking back. And this letter one is what took this book from being just like an interesting read to possibly one of my newfound favorite books but two also feels very much like the author personally addressing the audience in essence. 
I mean, obviously it is written from the perspective and the character of Margaret and the events within the book, but just the core emotion and feeling behind it feels very, very genuine and like it could just be the author talking directly to the reader and ends with a line that just completely fucks you up and is not at all expected and gives a little bit of a twist that just really makes the emotions hit home. So as you can probably gather from that description of the story, it is incredibly surrealist and just a very very unique narrative that I have never seen anything come close to being just like I can't even explain it. It's just so weird and trippy to read and just fucking weird but like in the best way. I'm not saying that derogatory at all. Like I mean it as nicely as possible. That is just genuinely the most accurate description of it. Just very very surrealist. Definitely a touch of magical realism with a lot of these different elements that are just very normal within this world that is, you know, also just a very normal world. I believe the book does take place in like the 90s, so it's not necessarily a current day story, but very much a story of 90s adolescence and that experience that could be very relatable to some older readers but at the core also is very very relatable to you know this modern generation of teenagers as well. You know I'm somewhere in the middle like I was born in the 90s but my primary era of growing up was in the 2000s and I definitely found it to be incredibly relatable especially on the cusp of you know, that generation that had like a normal childhood before technology was kind of introduced into everything. But I do still think that it would be, you know, it's not so like violently 90s that it's unrelatable to younger generations. I do think that it is, you know, very relatable and ac applicable to just about anybody. I mean, I guess like the experiences aren't any, but like any age range, I feel like could appreciate the story at its core. The story really does so completely and accurately capture the essence of growing up as somebody who is designated female at birth and this concept of girlhood and growing up. With that concept being placed upon you, I think was just captured so intimately and so well that I don't think I've seen a more accurate representation of, you know, young girls possibly ever. Now obviously like the experiences and the happenings within the book aren't going to be 100% relatable to anybody but I think a lot of the emotions and feelings behind it are very applicable and relatable. The story switches between different narrative styles and perspectives that definitely make it a roller coaster of an experience reading and none of this is done in like a poorly written way. It is all very very intentional but it does lead to some sections of the book being more enjoyable or easier to read than others simply because it does switch up so often that it is just a narrative mess but it also completely works. I feel like explaining it, it sounds like a nightmare from a literature perspective, but it's truly well done and I feel like there's not any other way that this book could have been written. Like it definitely could have been written as more of a direct narrative where it's just the same style all the way through and it could have done really really well. But there's just something about the switch up between the narrative styles that just makes it so unique and unlike anything else I've ever seen. Whereas if it had just been the same all throughout, I don't think it would have had quite the same impact or memorability. The book does feature a variety of trans characters, but that definitely doesn't make it the focus of the narrative in any way. And it doesn't become relevant until towards the end of the story. And it's more of like a thing that's brought up in retrospect that makes a lot of other elements of the book make a lot more sense. I thought it was a really, really 
interesting perspective and take on the trans experience because so many books treat it as like the center of the story than something that just happened to be and especially you know not in like retrospect where it's like here's this entire story that happens and oh yeah by the way turns out these people are actually transgender so I thought that that was a really really interesting take and important inclusion to have one thing that I thought was really interesting and I'll be honest I'm not entirely sure if it was intentional or if I'm just projecting and reading a little bit too into it but I found the character of Margaret to be potentially neurodivergent coded simply with just her characterization a little bit like nothing about being neurodivergent or anywhere on the spectrum is mentioned in any way but there are just certain parts of her character that lead to that possibility including different like hyperfixations that she picks up and her missing and interactions with different social cues I thought were very reminiscent of people who are neurodivergent and if that was intentional I think that this is some fantastic representation for that community but if it's not intentional then I do still think that it has the potential of leading a lot of people to see themselves within the character. Similarly to like if anybody's familiar with the perks of being a wallflower, a lot of people read Charlie as being neurodivergent and on the autism spectrum and well like when asked about it the author said that it wasn't intentional but that he's happy about anybody who can like see themselves within the character this could very well be the same case like it may not have been intentional but it also very well may have been intentional I you know can't ask the author so I'm not sure but I do think that that was a nice element that adds to the book and then of course there is the main overarching theme of Margaret having an eating disorder and her experience living with that and trying to get help for that and being sick. We do touch upon the concept of people with eating disorders not always feeling like they're sick enough and how the disorders can be very very competitive with other people. It's hard to seek treatment and get help for them when you're surrounded by other people who are quote-unquote worse than you are instead of you know just wanting to do better for yourself you are often driven by the concept of wanting to prove yourself and proving that you're just as sick if not sicker than the other people and I think that that's something that a lot of people who discuss eating disorders don't grasp the concept of or don't capture quite accurately whereas this I think you know beautifully captured the concept of you know not feeling like you're sick enough but wanting other people to think you're sick enough and you know that competition with others while also wanting to help yourself and just the entire hurricane of emotions that eating disorders can display. I think that the experience was very very accurately depicted. I will have to say it was a little bit hard to read personally because I actually am personally going through a very very similar eating disorder experience and I am currently you know in treatment for it or more specifically I am currently ignoring my treatment for it because I I was recommended to get more intense treatment for it and I kind of shut down at that a little bit but after reading this book I do think that I'm going to get back on track with that and get back in touch with my healthcare professionals to get the help that I need. So while the book was a little bit triggering in some aspects, was a little bit inspiring in others so I don't think that it's something that would be too terribly triggering for anybody who does experience eating disorders or disordered eating for themselves but again there is always that risk so reader discretion is definitely advised. I do think that it is very you know it's a very important narrative to have depicted. With that being said I do want to note that the book does take place in the 90s so some of the terminology for some of the different disorders is a little bit outdated. For example EDNOS is very commonly referred to as 
Whereas in our current day, um, it's been several years since uh, healthcare professionals have kind of discarded the use of EDNOS and it has been rebranded. And I'll be honest, I don't know entirely how accurate the experience of being in an eating disorder treatment center is because that is something that I've never experienced from other people that I have heard about their experiences and things like that. I do feel like this is slightly outdated, but not in a way that's offensive or, you know, damaging in any way. But that is just a note that this isn't modern day. This is 30 years ago. God, the 90s were 30 years ago. While the book is definitely very, very weird, just very unusual, and may not necessarily be the most easy or best reading experience. I do think that it does have the benefit of, you know, being relatable and very, very important to a lot of people. I personally, you know, did have a lot of personal connection to it, but what really drove home for me was that last section of the book which was written as a letter definitely took it from being like an interesting read that I might revisit to one that I want to revisit again and again. Now obviously not everybody will be having that experience you know not everybody will agree with me. Some people may find it to be a little bit too unusual for their tastes or a little too unrelatable but I definitely urge you to give it a try and check it out. One thing that I did you know, neglect to mention prior to the review is that Margaret as a character is actually queer and there are several experiences and relationships that do relate to and lead to that, but I personally did not find that to be one of the main driving factors of the book. So while representation is definitely, you know, there and appreciated, it wasn't like the primary focus of the book. Like it was, but it wasn't. It's I don't know, it wasn't like one of the main focuses that I personally took from it, but I could very much see it as being one of the primary focuses that other people would take from it. So I think it very much depends on your own personal experience and what you're looking to relate to within the text. But that is something of note as well. It is definitely written with a bit of authority, seeing as the author themselves is a member of the queer community. They do have they them pronouns. And while I don't personally know the verification of their sexuality, I do know that they have been featured and involved in other queer texts as well, which leads me to believe that they do have a little bit of firsthand experience. Again, cannot personally verify what exactly that experience is, but it definitely doesn't feel like it's coming from somebody who doesn't complete, like fully understand the experience as a queer individual. So if you have any interest in checking the book out for yourself, it is currently for sale from Feminist Press, so leave all of their links down below. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I had a blast hanging out with y'all. Peace.